Hovercraft and dairy products are, of course, simple representations of the broad range of goods that a society might produce as it faces decisions about opportunity cost. Recently, the UK government decided to allocate more resources to healthcare, but faced the problem that the people best able to produce this output were already doing it. So if we want more healthcare, it's possible, but we have to transfer resources less and less suited to healthcare, and that means we can only do it at an increasing opportunity cost. So all societies have an opportunity cost of producing goods and services. Having recognised this principle, we can think about how we can utilise it in decisions as to what to produce. There are two ways of dealing with the issue. One way is for governments to own resources and to make the decisions on society's behalf. This is a command system, sometimes called a plan system. But another way is for people to own the resources and for them to decide what to produce. They'll be guided in those decisions by the way in which consumers use their incomes to buy whatever they want. This is called a market system. Bulgaria has experience with both. For 50 years they were dominated by the Soviet Union's command economy, where decisions about each kind of production and investment were made by the state. Now that Bulgaria has shed the command system and joined the European Union, decisions are increasingly guided by markets. Examples of this change can be seen everywhere in Bulgarian society, from street vendors and vibrant cafes to small businesses sprouting up in response to market demand. One such company is Red Devil Catering. In 1997, we decided finally to build a company and to name this company Red Devil. We had $25 and I took silver spoons and knives and forks from my, my mother and my partner took all the other things from uh, his mother. And uh, we start step by step and uh, most of uh, foreign uh, society accept our services. British, first of all, American after that and uh, they give us a chance, and they give us a strong support buying from us. And from small event, right now, we can manage to a few thousand people a day. Red Devil was started by two young entrepreneurs in response to market demand for fine foods and catering. Like many small businesses, they have responded quickly and aggressively to market demand among foreign embassies and international businesses like Microsoft. And have you given the silver spoons back to your mother now? Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, she still owned them and uh, we had a dinner when we invited over there. While new businesses have sprouted, the planned industries have withered. There are dilapidated factories that produced goods inefficiently or that no one wanted. And there are competitive industries that withered for lack of investment, such as the wine industry. So can you tell us something of the history of this particular field that we're in now? In 1934, my father's grandfather has bought this land and has started planting these particular vines. So now they're 70 years old. What's the matter with 70-year-old vines? They seem to be producing grapes. Произвеждат вино, какво става, uh, грозди, какво става с тях? Те раждат обаче, това е толкова с малко, че просто... First, the quality of the vine is so low, and the quantity is so low, that it's not enough to pay the investment from all these big vines. You may count two or three grapes. Колко е малка? It's too small, and the quality, it's not good. So what are you going to do now? Well, my father and my family plans this September to replace these old vines with new one and just to start my grand-grandfather business again. The wine industry suffered because the planners in the command system chose to invest elsewhere. Every investment has an opportunity cost. Resources invested in one industry are not available to be invested in another. Now that the wine industry is back in private ownership, the new owners face the prospect of investing and rebuilding to meet market demand. 
The command system produced many failures in Bulgaria. It also produced some successes. This is a stunning location in the Rodopi Mountains. This was a former monastery and it was really rescued by communist money being poured into it for a UNESCO conference. And now it's become a hotel complex. It's a great success story, but it's a success story built on communist expenditure. What we're going to see is that in spite of some successes, the state controlled system had real problems. This will then lead us to see the benefit of the market system. Under this market system, people become aware of opportunity cost because they pay for that cost in the price of the product. But let's first examine how markets use prices to determine opportunity cost. Why is the price of an ice cream so much less than the price of a luxury car like a Rolls Royce? The answer is to be found in opportunity cost. Why should that guy make an ice cream for you? There are other things that he could do with his time. If you want him to make the ice cream for you and not do anything else, then you must persuade him to give up all the alternatives that he could do with his time in order to make your ice cream. Then you'll have to pay a sufficient price to cover the opportunity cost of his labor. Why is a Rolls Royce so expensive? Because you want lots of people to produce lots of things in order to produce the Rolls Royce. You have to persuade all of those people not to do something else. You have to persuade all those people to spend their time making the car for you. Why should they do it? Because in the price of the car, you are paying the opportunity cost of all those resources. So price reflects opportunity cost. It's the key idea about the market system that the price of a good reflects the opportunity cost of the resources used up in production. In planned economies, prices are not set by markets. Decisions about production and the allocation of resources were made by governments. And as we shall see, making decisions in a planned economy that reflect opportunity cost isn't easy. So what were the problems that societies like Bulgaria had when they tried to use a command system rather than a market system? There are many problems, but there are three in particular that it's worth focusing on. Where the command system is at a disadvantage and in principle, the market system has an enormous advantage. The first one relates to preferences. In a command system, the central authority has to decide which kinds of outputs are going to be produced. But they don't know what people's preferences are. People might prefer one kind of output to another. And there's no way that the state has of knowing. Remnants of this problem can be seen everywhere in Bulgaria, in the massive housing projects where no one chooses to live, and the empty factories that manufactured unwanted goods. But in a market system, producers get to know what preferences are because prices are established, market prices, and market prices tell producers what consumers are willing to pay. So that in the prices paid, consumers reveal their preferences for different kinds of goods. The second problem about a command economy that we want to focus on is the problem of incentives. In a command economy, the planners determine what kinds of goods are to be produced and then instruct resources, labor, capital and so on in its production. The person producing these goods has an incentive to keep the planner happy and produce what he's told, but that's not the same as saying he has an incentive to produce what's best for him and for society. His rate of pay is determined in advance. He doesn't get paid according to the quality and quantity of the goods he produces. 
but in a market system, resources, including your labour, are privately owned. So you have an incentive to produce what people want because that's what's going to be most profitable for you. So there's much more advantage to the market system because incentives are built into the market structure. The third problem is the one of coordination. It sounds very simple in a planned system that a planner determines how many loaves of bread should be produced in the course of a year. But once you determine how many loaves of bread to produce, that helps to determine how many fields of wheat need to be grown. And the amount of wheat to be grown determines the amount of tractors to produce, which determines how much steel needs to be produced, which determines how much coal needs to be dug out of the ground to make that possible. So one decision about the final output which is going to consumers means a large number of decisions are going to be taken with regard to the production of these intermediate goods. All these plans have to be consistent and there has to be a large amount of coordination to make it possible. The market solves the coordination problem quite simply. Market prices determine the price of all goods, those consumers purchase, and all the intermediate goods necessary to produce consumer goods. There are market prices for cars, but also market prices for coal, steel, robotics, and the labor necessary to manufacture cars. So if there's a problem and a shortage of, let's say, steel develops, market prices of steel rise, that gives an incentive to producers to produce more steel to fill in the gap. So coordination is a huge problem in a command economy. In a market system, the problems of coordination can usually be left to the market to solve itself. In all these ways then, there is a strong case for saying that the command system is clumsy and not very efficient. And that's why Eastern European countries have been willing to change their form of production to a much more market-orientated society. <laughs>